Sakima lana peok. Nuru linda muhana. Eli paukwa lana e hokin. Kulama siho. Watch a mohomo. Enda au piak. Hello everyone. I greet you in the Unami Lanape language. My name is Curtis Zuniga. I am co director of the Lenape Center in Manhattan, New York. On behalf of Lenape Center, I am pleased that you all are here in Lenape Hoking, the original and eternal homeland of the Lenape. I hope you all are well and that you continue to live well while you are here. In this time of a global pandemic, which has changed our current lifestyle, I send this video greeting on behalf of Lenape Center. We extend our sincere appreciation to the graduating class at Columbia University School of Social Work. We also want to extend our encouragement and support to you as you enter a world where your service is needed in a compassionate, caring, and respectful way. We, the Lenape, and many, many indigenous societies have suffered and endured centuries of pandemics, biological warfare, expulsion, extermination, diaspora, and erasure. But the enduring spirit of our Lenape ancestors keeps our work going as a tribute to those ancestors. We are still here because of them and because of that enduring spirit. And we encourage you to keep the faith as you serve your respective communities and endure this difficult time with hope and perseverance. One issue. Thank you. Congratulations to the Columbia School of Social Work Class of 2020. You've made it. You have achieved a remarkable milestone during a most remarkable year. I know you didn't do it alone, so let's take a moment to give sincere thanks to your family, friends, and loved ones. Those who encouraged you, sustained you, and sometimes even sacrificed for you to reach this point. It's their achievement too, and I know they share in your joy today. It's been a remarkable year for me too, and not just because this was my first year as Dean of this outstanding school. Over the past several months, COVID-19 has left an indelible mark on all of us for so many reasons. I would like us all to take a moment to pause and honor your fellow student and friend, Susan Schwang, who lost her life to COVID in early April. As our tribute page has shown, Susan also left her indelible mark on all of those she met and touched. Let us keep her spirit and her passion and her kindness alive in our hearts. Over the past few months, the great pandemic that many had predicted and feared finally came to be. COVID has ravaged our communities in New York City and elsewhere, especially among our siblings in the African-American, Latinx and indigenous communities. It has torn away any remaining masks or band-aids over the gaps in the social safety net. It has brought into startlingly clear focus the problems caused by lack of access to healthcare and uneven access to economic opportunity. 
It has rendered painfully apparent the structural inequalities in our society, perhaps more than anything else has done in recent decades. It also makes abundantly clear the need for social work, attention to social welfare, and renewed dedication to social justice. So I'm heartened today because you stand ready to take action against injustice, to combat racism and discrimination, to provide support and partnership to those in need, and to promote policy change that will reduce needless suffering. You are our hope because of your commitment, ingenuity, and empathy. I think that this past semester has proven how vital empathy is to the social work profession. You prove its importance every day. In the face of great pain, most people turn and run in the other direction. You, as social workers, will run towards it. We have all borne witness to great distress and sadness, yet you, our graduates, have demonstrated tremendous resilience in the face of significant challenges. Your efforts, along with those of our talented faculty and staff, have brought us to this point. What enables this resilience? What will you take away from these defining events? Which memories will be most important to you in the coming years? These thoughts about memory and empathy caused me to take a quick look at the research that evaluates the relationship between these two traits. But first, let me share a memory that involves quite a lot of empathy back from when I was a teenager. At age 16, I became very ill, not life-threatening, but enough to keep me in bed for about a month. What I recall most is staring at the ceiling above my bed. And what impresses me about that memory is that I stared at that ceiling for hours and days and weeks on end, and I was not bored. That's how sick I was. But here's my other strong memory of that period, the sight of my father in a garden chair in the corner of the room. The garden chair was truly hideous with these turquoise and white stripes, no doubt picked up on sale at the local grocery store. Every night, my father would pick up that chair and bring it to my room and read the paper at the end of my bed. He would read as I continued my relentless study of the ceiling. He knew I would not be in the mood to talk or even to listen but he wanted to be present with me, to make me a little less lonely. It was loving and calming and reassuring. And as you can see, I never forgot. What is the connection between empathy and memory? Psychologists and neuroscientists tell us that there are two kinds of empathy, cognitive and affective. Cognitive empathy refers to the conscious intellectual effort of imagining how someone else feels in a particular situation. Affective empathy is the actual ability to feel as that person feels. Both types are, I'm sure, highly prevalent among social workers, and both types relate to short-term and long-term memory in different ways. It turns out that emotional stimulation can enhance the formation of long-term memory. For short-term memories, the picture is a bit more complicated. Empathic pain can exert either a facilitating or an impairing effect on working or short-term memory, while the ability to take another's perspective has been shown to improve it. Why does this matter? I would argue that it matters a great deal now. Having empathy can improve our tendency to engage in pro-social helping behaviors Helping behaviors are empathic responses designed to relieve suffering in others, exactly what social workers do day in and day out. And given what we are now experiencing with COVID-19, we want and need to promote these helping behaviors widely for the good of one another. Let's take it one step further. Why should this matter to you right now? Memory helps to fuel imagination. And imagination allows us to conceive of a better future. And conceiving of that future is the first step to achieving it. You have all formed intense memories of your time here at Columbia Social Work. Memories that are deeply influenced by COVID and its consequences. You must use these memories to reimagine the future. A future in which empathy and equity are paramount. Though you may feel discouraged, don't give in. In the words of Nelson Mandela, 
it always seems impossible until it's done. You can bring a kinder, better future to reality. This brings me back to another memory, again of my father. This one takes place decades later with a man in his 90s and a daughter in her 40s. The ugly turquoise and white chair is gone, thankfully. But the man, my father, has suffered tremendous memory loss due to dementia. He stares at me and says, it's funny. I look at you and I don't know who you are, but I know when I look at your face that I love you. Further proof of the strong connection between empathy and memory and proof that the most important memories will persist beyond all expectation. Your memories of this time will persist your abilities and your confidence will grow and you will make a huge difference out there because we need you to. We have much to do and now you have the knowledge and the skills and the compassion to do it. I want to close with this inspirational directive from President Barack Obama. Keep believing, keep marching, Keep building, keep raising your voice. Every generation has the opportunity to remake the world. Graduates, I believe in you and I am so very grateful for you. Thank you and again, congratulations. Hello, everyone. Please take a moment wherever you are right now to stop, take a deep breath, and give yourself a huge pat on the back. Congratulations for making it to this point under unthinkable and maybe seemingly impossible circumstances. And let's take a moment to express our deepest gratitude to our loved ones and to those here in the Columbia School of Social Work community who have made our journeys possible and who have nurtured and supported us over the years. Hopefully some of those special individuals are joining us virtually today. So let me introduce myself briefly. My name is Laura Kimberly and I have been a doctoral student here at Columbia School of Social Work since the fall of 2013. My own personal journey has taken some twists and turns. I was in many of your shoes completing my MSW back in 2006. And at the time, I didn't think that I'd be going back to school in my late 30s. After years of practice in policy administration, research, and education, eventually I made my way back to academia to begin my PhD. And now I focus on health and well being across the lifespan. At each step along the way, the expected and the unanticipated have made significant contributions to my own understanding of the important roles that social workers have to play in so many domains, in large part because our professional values translate across so many different contexts. Along my journey, I also became a mother to my two little ones. For me, the professional and the personal are inextricably linked. I am who I am professionally because of who I am personally and vice versa. And we as social workers have a particularly keen understanding of selfhood as relational. And this is foundational to the value we place on social justice, advocacy, and service. So now here we are on May 20th, 2020, graduating in the midst of a global pandemic. And I think it's probably safe to say that none of us envisioned that we would be connecting remotely to a virtual commencement ceremony. I don't know exactly how the past two months have unfolded for each of you, but if it has been anything like my own experience, you've been dealing with disruption, uncertainty, anxiety, and probably a lot of grief and loss. Many of you may be experiencing financial hardship, including loss of income or employment. Many of you may be taking on additional caregiving responsibilities for children or older relatives. You may also be homeschooling your children. Some of you may be ill or recovering yourselves or caring for others who are ill. 
and some of you may even be grieving the loss of loved ones. This is not at all what we had envisioned, and yet here we are. And despite all the worry and the uncertainty and the fear, despite the sadness and loss, I believe this moment will actually open unexpected doors for us as social work professionals. Now, more than ever, our understanding of the confluence of power, race, oppression, and privilege, our training in social work practice, research, and policy, and our lived experiences as social workers are desperately needed to help us all chart a way forward that recognizes the unacceptable inequalities that are pervasive in our country and around the globe. The COVID-19 pandemic has shined a spotlight on the glaring disparities that continue to widen. And moving forward, our voices have a critical role to play as advocates for our clients and communities, as community organizers, as educators and researchers, and as policymakers and policy influencers. We are needed now, perhaps more than ever before, and so, class of 2020, let's get out there, metaphorically at the moment. Let's raise our voices. Let's join together with our friends, colleagues, and communities, and mobilize everything we've learned here at Columbia and through the many other chapters and dimensions of our lives. And let's make waves and move mountains. This is our professional calling. We have the tools and the world needs us. Thank you. Good afternoon, graduates, faculty, staff, family, and friends. I'm Sherry Simon from Brooklyn, New York. I hope you are all doing well today. Only five short months ago, we were all counting down towards a new decade. And now here we are, and the entire world as we know it has changed. We all had to make swift decisions during stressful times, and now it's like we're on a cliffhanger. We were forced to terminate with clients, professors, staff, close friends, and classmates awkwardly through virtual spaces. We didn't get any proper goodbyes, and honestly, that kind of hurts. But despite how much everything has changed, one thing has remained the same, our commitment to social justice. And that is why the world needs us now more than ever. And here we are in our caps and gowns, as if it were our armor, ready to conquer the world. We have never shied away from answering a call to serve. Let us not start today. As I wrote this speech, I thought back to August 2018 for the two-year residential orientation, that hot day in the International Building, before the fire alarm was pulled, to the mountains that we have moved since being in this program, and that warms my heart. And then I thought about the advanced standing student orientation, their first day all the way to now. They've achieved so much in just one year at CSSW, and that makes me honored. And then I thought about the unique journey that my online extended 16th month transfer and reduced residency classmates have taken, and it makes me proud to call you all my colleagues. We may have not started this journey all together, but we are finishing together. We are forever bonded as a class that charted unprecedented times together. We started CSSW eager yet nervous, and truthfully, COVID-19 has brought us all full circle. We are now unsure of what the future holds, but now we are so much more equipped to handle what life throws our way. If social work has taught us anything, it's how to handle crisis with limited resources. Our time at Columbia has been marked with ups and downs, but we've always come out on top. Through the tears, the laughter, the stress, and the joy, we have built our resumes, our integrity, our character. We enjoyed boat rides, wine and cheese receptions, and we survived way too many process recordings, psychosocials, case notes, group projects, readings, and late nights. Many of us have spent our time at CSSW in New York City, one of the greatest cities, might I add, and we survived. It's safe to say that if we can survive it in New York City and CSSW, that we can make it anywhere. And it goes without saying that if we can make it through a global pandemic, there is truly nothing that can stop us. Did you all know that before all of this, they called 2020 the year of perfect vision? 
How powerful is that? Class of 2020, we are the class of perfect vision. As we embark on our careers and pursue further education, we must do so with perfect vision. Not just vision to see what's in front of us, but vision to see past that. Vision to see a future that feels like it may never arrive, but nevertheless, we must persist. Vision to see humanity and people, even when policies and laws attempt to strip it away from them. Class of 2020, it is our responsibility to be visionaries. As we go into our respective roles with policy, program development, and clinical work, we must do so in a holistic way. It's not enough to work in silos. We must push for cross-sector collaboration. For that is where true change exists. Our collective strength, our collective vision will bring about the change that we so desperately need to see in this world. Our collective vision will unlock liberation for all people. And as we move forward from MSW students to MSW and LMSW practitioners, we must keep our eyes on justice. We must fix our hearts on equity. And with that commitment to social action, we will make our mark we will leave this world a better place than we ever found it. Class of 2020, it is our time. We are who we've been waiting for. We are the new legacy. And our voices will forever echo through the halls of Columbia School of Social Work, Zoom, and every other space that we encounter because we are, Class of 2020, the new visionaries of social work. I hope that our paths will cross again. May we be prosperous in everything that we do. And as we do this work in the midst of a global pandemic, let's remember to be gentle with ourselves. May we remain fierce advocates, leaders, and disruptors who honor our self-care, boundaries, and mental health needs while we make waves, move mountains, and change lives. Class of 2020, congratulations. We have truly earned this. Thank you. At this point in the program, it is my very great honor to introduce the Columbia School of Social Work 2020 commencement speaker, Professor Ruha Benjamin. Ruha Benjamin is Associate Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University, where she is also founder of the Just Data Lab. She has authored two exceptional books. First is People's Science, Bodies and Rights on the Stem Cell Frontier. And the most recent is Race After Technology, Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Code, as well as a host of other publications. Her work investigates the social dimensions of science, medicine, and technology with a focus on the relationship between innovation and inequity, health and justice, and knowledge and power. Professor Benjamin is the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including recognition from the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Science Foundation, the Institute for Advanced Study, as well as the President's Award for Distinguished Teaching at Princeton. We are delighted that Professor Benjamin could join us today. Her exciting scholarship on race and technology and her advocacy for a more socially conscious approach to technology development both resonate strongly with our mission here at Columbia Social Work. Please join me in welcoming this outstanding scholar and advocate for social justice. Columbia School of Social Work, Class of 2020, congratulations to each and every one of you, your family, friends, your entire squad. I'm honored to celebrate this moment with you in part because of how vital the profession of social work has always been, but especially now. And I'm not just referring to your day-to-day -day work, the glue holding our fractured society together, but more fundamentally, because you're entering the field when the very idea of the social is routinely undermined and attacked. When the basic idea that not only should a diverse populace coexist, but that each person should have what they need to exist in the first place is somehow controversial. As I was thinking about what to share with you today, I flashbacked to this moment in the documentary, The Great Hack, which you should all definitely watch. There's this moment when the narrator is explaining the goal of those using fake news to manipulate the electorate during uh, the 2016 election and Brexit vote on both sides of the Atlantic. 
the aim of these disinformation architects was, is to break society. According to Steve Bannon, for example, it is only when you break it that you can remodel the pieces into your vision of a new society. Of course, their new vision of a society is nothing new, just more white supremacy, more class warfare, more patriarchy, more imperialism. And to get more, they need to break or continue to break the social contract by deepening divisions and amplifying hierarchies using what might be better called anti-social media. The point being, there are powerful people and organizations working overtime to undermine the very premise of society. What then does it mean to be a social worker in a context when there's a deliberate campaign to break the social? For starters, I think it means thinking about your profession beyond a specific set of skills or credentials. I think it entails a keen understanding that many of the policies and structures that govern our lives are working against the social, pushing a corrosive individualism cloaked in the language of freedom. This was true before the pandemic and has only intensified since. Social work can and should challenge the corrosive individualism that infects every area of our lives. Social work can and should work against the revolting distortion of freedom talk, which is really just the, the freedom to go to work without sick leave, the freedom to nurse the ailing without protective gear, the freedom to grow the nation's food with the looming threat of ice raids, the freedom to be warehoused in prisons with no way to socially distance the freedom to be stranded in nursing homes with no way to avoid contagion, the freedom not to care as the most vulnerable die off. The aim of this strain of freedom, a freedom from mutual obligation, is to break society, to erode mutuality, to grind down our ability to care for one another to eat away at any notion of a collective good, and to destroy the institutions upon which our society depends. In this context, social workers are not only on the front lines of a global pandemic, but at a much more fundamental level, you're called upon to be champions of the social contract itself. The fact is ours has never stopped being a eugenically structured society designed for the fittest to flourish and the vulnerable to die off. Whereas in a past era, social workers have aided and abetted eugenic policies of classification, sterilization, and institutionalization. Now you have an obligation to reject the practices and policies that continue to perpetuate a survival of the fittest eugenic society. This destructive ideology was alive and kicking well before the pandemic, and it's been revived now to reconsolidate power and privilege in the wake of this crisis. So why can't we seem to bury it once and for all? It's tempting to tell a story going back just a few months or a few years in which our federal government made a series of monstrous decisions from firing the entire pandemic response team in 2018 to the administration's slow and ineffective adoption of public health measures up to the present. But of course, the story goes back hundreds of years in which our deeply stratified social order is rooted in genocide and slavery. The Indigenous Peoples Movement and Lakota People's Law Project reminded us as much in a virtual town hall titled from smallpox to COVID-19, let's heal one another, which drew attention to this longer genocidal history of infectious disease, but also to the life-affirming cultural traditions which we can and must build on. This long view also reminds us that one of the deeply distorting features of our society is that human beings were treated in law and custom as things 
that our enslaved ancestors were not simply exploited to enrich the slaveocracy, but that they were the riches, human beings, bought, sold, transformed into capital assets, that they were insured and used as collateral underwriting white credit. The entire foundation, financial fin foundation of our society was built on the extraction of value from black labor and indigenous land. We can't bury this past, in other words, because white accumulation and racial dispossession produced this nation. Given this context, the phrase essential worker takes on added meaning when it comes to how we treat labor in this nation. Who after all were the first essential workers? Essential to exploit, essential to sacrifice, essential to coerce, essential to gaslight, essential to romanticize, essential to resist, essential to organize, essential to protect, essential to pay, essential to care. We can't simply bury this history because racism is productive, not in the sense of being good, but in the literal capacity of racism to produce things of value to some, even as it wreaks havoc on others. We're still taught to think of racism as an aberration, a glitch, an accident, an isolated incident, a bad apple in the backwoods and outdated, rather than as innovative, systemic, diffuse, an attached incident, the entire orchard, in, in the ivory tower, forward-looking, even viral. In sociology, we like to say race is socially constructed, but we often fail to state the corollary that racism constructs. In the context of the pandemic, we know who racism is harming, but who is it benefiting? What is it producing? If we only look at the underside, we miss seeing who racism is enriching, whose lives it is extending. The combined effects of racism and capitalism intersect and infect every aspect of the pandemic. Who has access to personal protective equipment? Who's treated with care and dignity when they go to the hospital? Which businesses are receiving bailout? Which students are able to transition to remote learning? Who police are arresting for social distancing violations? For those of us sheltering in place, who's growing and packaging our food? Who's delivering our mail? Who's working in nursing homes? Who's disinfecting public space while the rest of us sleep? Who's keeping public transportation running? Who's picking up the garbage? Who, in other words, is holding society together? Essential, but devalued. As the poet M. Norbisi Phillip put it, if we were truly in this together, we would not be in this together. This reality, however, isn't inevitable rather the outcome of choices that people and institutions make to invest in some things, but not in others. But together, we can and must insist on radically different investments as part of what it means to do social work. I should say too that one of the many ways cycles of dispossession persist is that a growing number of people are willing to acknowledge race, but not racism. In so doing, they'll talk about racial differences of all sorts, but then distort the reason for those differences by pointing to the poor behavior of individuals or the poor value of different cultures. At a recent press conference, for example, the US Surgeon General singled out Blacks and Latinos to urge no drinking or smoking as a preventative measure during the pandemic, which plays into a long history of government officials invoking the supposedly bad behavior of racialized groups as the reason for their hardship. We see it with the very different responses to black and white drug use, for example. One is a public health emergency, the other a crime. This, as we know, is textbook distortion, pulled from the culture of poverty playbook, which lets the bad behavior of powerful institutions off the hook. And this distorting lens is not just a top-down phenomenon. It permeates everyday understandings of racial disparities. Teachers use it, employers use it, police use it, sadly, social workers use it, even doctors and nurses use it. 
For example, a friend of mine, Professor Kiara Bridges, was recently on the radio talking about the racial dimensions of the pandemic. And a nurse who'd listened to the interview emailed Professor Bridges to say, quote, I believe you have some huge blind spots. I am white, 64, registered nurse who has worked in critical care for 40 years. I dated a black man from Louisiana, she tells us. I am experienced at being a bedside nurse and interfacing with blacks in intimate situations. I may have insight that you do not. I take issue with your comment about perhaps Blacks not getting good health care prior to admission to ICU. You made no mention of whether these patients took responsibility for their own health, all caps. I believe that Black culture, in caps, increases the likelihood of Blacks not being taken care of as well as whites. It is a choice of their own. They damaged themselves before they ever got to the hospital. The nurse's email goes on for several pages, acknowledging health disparities, but blaming it on the poor behavior of individuals and the pathology of black culture. Textbook culture of poverty talk. The point is two people can look at the same data and interpret it in dramatically different ways. One person narrowing the focus on individual bodies and behaviors and the other zooming the lens out to include all of the factors that actually lead to illness and premature death. We've all heard or thought some version of this distorting narrative in our personal and professional lives. And so one of the commitments we can all make is not to let it slide because the narrow interpretation is not simply lazy or just another opinion. It's wrong and dangerous. When it comes to the pandemic, for example, we hear a lot of talk about the pre-existing biological conditions that make poor and racialized people more vulnerable to the virus. But we have to be very clear to name the pre-existing social conditions in housing, employment, and healthcare that have impacted communities well before the pandemic. The social ills of our nation, not simply the biological ailments of individuals, are leading to higher rates of Black, Latinx, and Indigenous deaths so far. So in wrapping up, I've been reflecting on a recent essay titled The Pandemic is a Portal by one of my favorite thinkers, Aranzati Roy. In it, she reminds us that, quote, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. To do this though, I think we have to reckon honestly with all that we've been carrying, because if not careful, we almost certainly will carry with us dead ideas, sometimes disguised as new and enlightened. When we have a more expansive understanding of what ails us, we can develop a more transformative approach to healing. Even the fact that we have a hard time imagining a society with universal health care or a world with without prisons is a reminder that our imagination of what is possible is constricted. Imagination is not an ephemeral afterthought that we have the luxury to dismiss or romanticize, but a tool, a resource, an animating part of social work. In fact, we should acknowledge that most people are forced to live inside someone else's imagination. And one of the things we have to come to grips with is how the nightmares that many people are forced to endure are the underside of elite fantasies about efficiency, profit, security, and social control. Racism, among other axes of, of domination, helps to produce this fragmented imagination. Misery for some, monopoly for others. This means that for those of us who want to construct a different social reality, one grounded in justice and joy, we can't only critique the world as it is, we have to work on building the world as it should be. This is social work. That said, I know, I know this is a lot to ask. The more we understand how oppression is perpetuated, the more overwhelming it feels as we each try to figure out what part we can play. 
But I want to suggest that precisely because of the many ways that inequity takes shape in our laws and policies, in our norms and practices, institutionally and interpersonally, this means that no matter what context we're working in, we can find ways to work against injustice and work for solidarity. In the process, we can draw upon the example and insights of so many people who did this work before us, like the incomparable James Baldwin, who said, I can't be a pessimist because I'm alive. To be a pessimist means that you have agreed that human life is an academic matter. So I am forced to believe that we can survive whatever we must survive. And like the brilliant Audre Lorde who wrote in her cancer journals, I have found that battling despair does not mean closing my eyes to the enormity of the tasks of affecting change, nor ignoring the strength and the barbarity of the forces aligned against us. It means teaching, surviving, and fighting with the most important resource I have, myself, and taking joy in the battle. She goes on to say, it means for me recognizing the enemy outside and the enemy within, and knowing that my work is part of a continuum of women's work, of reclaiming this earth and our power, and knowing that this work did not begin with my birth, nor will it end with my death. Drawing upon this ancestral wisdom, Baldwin, Lord, and so many others, every single one of us has a role in envisioning and building a more just and joyful society than the one we currently inhabit. If this virus has taught us anything, it's that something that is invisible can be deadly. This also means that seemingly small things, small decisions, small actions, can have exponential effects in the other direction, affirming life and invigorating society. This is social work. Each year, the Columbia School of Social Work bestows several awards to recognize the extraordinary work of its students. It's my great pleasure to present both the Campbell Award and the Hoffman Award for 2020. The Campbell Award was established by the University Trustees and the Board of the Columbia Alumni Association in 2016. This prestigious award is given to a graduating student at each Columbia school who demonstrates exceptional leadership and Columbia spirit as exemplified by the late alumnus Bill Campbell, Chair Emeritus of the University's Board of Trustees and a co-founder of the Columbia Alumni Association. I am delighted to announce that this year's winner is Brian Anderson. A decorated military veteran, Brian founded Veterans Alternative, a Florida-based nonprofit organization committed to providing effective, evidence-based alternative treatments to address the challenges that veterans can face when they return home, including physical and mental health needs, poverty and insecurity, and trauma and recovery. Through Brian's leadership, Veterans Alternative implemented a state-funded wellness program for veterans and successfully lobbied Florida legislators to fund studies on PTSD and traumatic brain injury. In just four years of operation, Veterans Alternative has raised two and a half million dollars and it continues to grow. Brian, as a student of our online campus, you have been an exemplary member of our school community. This award is a wonderful recognition of your outstanding leadership. Your work to expand resources vet to veterans exemplifies the social work spirit of stepping forward to support the most vulnerable among us. We are so proud to have you represent the school as this year's Campbell Awardee. Congratulations, Brian. And now I am thrilled to announce this year's recipients of the Linda and Peter Hoffman Writing Award. This award recognizes students who achieve excellence in the conceptual and technical components of proposal development. Linda Hoffman, social work class of 1968, endowed the Hoffman Writing Award and the Hoffman Lecture Series with her husband, Peter, in order to promote the craft of writing at Columbia 
and throughout the social work profession. As Linda describes in her introduction to the Columbia Guide to Social Work Writing, the ability to write clearly, thoughtfully, and persuasively equips us as advocates and change makers across every field of social work. Good writing changes lives. We are enormously grateful to Linda and Peter for their generous support of this year's Hoffman Award winners. The 2020 recipients are, first, Chin Sun, for Preliminary Report, Phone Angel 2020, a telephone assurance program for Chinese immigrant elders in New York City amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Second award goes to Alexandria Bowling, Cecilia Jiaxin Xu, Chloe Lincoln, Isabella Sade, Claudia Sanchez, and Sage Simpson for Lessons on Research in Times of COVID-19. Third and finally, we have Bethel Asifa, Shireen Azadi Khan, Victoria Narezo, Javita Indranath, Ghazal Rezvani, and Brisa Trinidad for Understanding the Lived Experiences of Non-Syrian Refugees in Turkey, a Mixed Methodology Study. To all of the Hoffman awardees, well done. We congratulate all of these winners and the entire class for their remarkable accomplishments. Let me close by recognizing that all of our graduates are now our newest alums. You join a fantastic network of over 19,000 social work alums worldwide. Your fellow alums are eager to connect with you. Please see the commencement website for a message from Martinique Tepperman, president of the Columbia School of Social Work Alumni Association.